Uh, Kit is traveling today, so it's just going to be me. Uh, I will try to go and check on questions, but I'll probably have a little, be a little bit slower in doing that just because I don't have my partner in crime here. But with that, we're going to get started here. So let me share my screen. Okay, so to summarize where we are, we are on week three of the mini series we're doing on building Zio from scratch getting a better understanding together of how Zio works by actually making it ourselves and peering under the hood and seeing that there's, well, there's definitely stuff going on there. There's nothing that is rocket science and it's stuff that we can, we can all understand. So the first week we uh, had a pretty impressive initial uh, encoding from uh, Kit and what we did there was we implemented some of these basic operators. And right now there are actually only four primitives in the Zio language we have, but they let us express a lot. And initially each of these had its own run method attached to it that says, here's how to run this part of the computation. So we have succeed that just lets us put a value inside an existing value inside of a Zio computation. We had effect, which lets us embed an arbitrary synchronous side effect. We had async, which let us embed asynchronous side effects. So if we want to work with any third party API that provides a callback based API, we can use this to import it into Zio. We had flat map, which lets us do computation sequentially. So do this and then do this. And we had fork, which let us kick off another computation that was gonna run concurrently with the existing main computation. And so just with those five operators, we were able to implement a decent amount here. So let me go here and we can remind ourselves. So just with those operators, we were able to implement uh, something like this uh, forking example here, where we can fork two different effects that are going to proceed concurrently. Then we're just going to print on the main fiber. Hey, <laughs> that's nice. We fork these two things. Then we're going to wait for them and we're going to print their results. And we will do the, all this with actual concurrency and actual different threads here, just with those four basic operators. And then in the second week, we moved from that I would say a little bit of a hybrid between a declarative and an executable encoding where each of these things had its own run method that worked, but that wasn't stack safe and didn't give us everything we need to eventually build all the things we want. And we moved to a more fully declarative encoding where each of these things is just a pure description. And then all of the execution takes place in this run method here, which creates this run loop that is just going to, essentially in a very, very imperative way, it's just going to look at this um, stack of instructions, essentially. It's just gonna say, okay, I've got this instruction. What do I do with it? And it's just going to interpret each of those instructions. And the one that was probably trickiest here was this flat map one, because flat map says, we'll do this thing, but then do this other thing. And so in a very almost old school way, we introduced this concept of a stack here where we said, well, that continuation, we're just gonna put it on the stack and we're gonna go and execute the next thing. And when we run out of things to do, we're just gonna pop the next thing off the stack. So in a way it's very, it's very similar to what you might think in like a very, very imperative language, but it allows us to avoid building up these long, 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 nested uh, thunks that eventually are gonna stack overflow for us. And so with what we had here, by the end of this, we were able to run this stack safety example where we print howdy 100,000 times and then we don't do anything other than printing howdy, but we're able to do it 100,000 times when we don't stack overflow. Uh, we also did some work last time on concurrency safety. So we used a, 
atomic reference here to model the state of this fiber in a way that's safe for concurrent access. And we we did some stepping back and thinking about, okay, how does, why do we need that? How does something, how has one of these atomic variables work? Uh, so um, <laughs> as soon as we have it available, if, you, if you're interested in that and you missed it, go back and check the video on that. We've had a little bit of technical difficulties on getting the videos out, so we'll have those shortly, but apologies, we didn't have that before the session today. Uh, so with that, for today, uh, we're gonna go back to our checklist here. And so we said we wanna to move to declarative coding, We've done that. We said we wanna have stack safety, check. So we wanna have concurrency safety, check. Today, we're gonna to focus on error handling. We're gonna to try to add the E-type parameter eventually. Uh, but before that, we're actually gonna do even a little bit more work on this declarative encoding here. Just because we want to build the we want to build the right infrastructure as we're building more functionality in here. Just because if we have, don't have the right architecture, then it's it's going to take a little more work for us later to move everything over to what we're eventually going to need. So if we can think about what we're going to need now and kind of set ourselves up that way, it's just going to make it easier for us in the future. So the good thing about what we have right now is we've we've made these operations here just pure descriptions. And we've created this run loop here that has a lot of the information about what's going on as we're executing uh, this ZO computation. So it has the stack. And we can imagine here eventually adding more and more information to this. Of uh, It could have information of whether we're interrupted, whether we're in an interruptible region, uh, what the environment is that we're using. Uh, we can add a lot of information here and do it in a way that we're going to have access to it and be able to work with it, but our user isn't going to have to explicitly pass it around. Another nice thing we're going to be able to do with this is allow users to uh, shift between execution contexts without having to manually specify that. Uh, so it won't be like future where you have to have that implicit execution context all the time. We can just have the current executor as a value within this run loop, and then we can have ways to change that or access that. But what is a little bit less than ideal here right now is we've got a lot of state here in this run loop, but we've also got a bunch of state up here in this fiber, right? We had this fiber state we created. This has the callbacks that are waiting on the fiber, the result that's done. We have this atomic reference. So right now, as we're going through and we're running a large ZO computation, we essentially have state in two different places. We have it in that run loop, and then we have it in the fiber. And that's not ideal for us because what we really want is we want all of that information in one place so we can potentially access it, change it, use it as we're going through and we're running this computation. And as we think about it, that's actually pointing us to a little bit of a deeper insight here, which is if we go to this run method here, so this is the thing that's actually gonna run the ZO computation. And right now it's saying, okay, if you wanna run me, maybe we call this unsafe run eventually, you give me a callback, that's the final thing that you as the client wanna do with that result, and then I'll call that whenever I'm done. But all this thing gives back is unit. And we, we might think there's something a little bit strange about that because as we're going through a whole ZO program, we have these fibers and we've said fibers are things we can join and get the results when they become available. We haven't implemented it yet, but eventually we're gonna want fibers to have an operator that says we can interrupt them. I'll leave this as a question mark for now because we'll have to implement that later. And so you could say, well, if, if whenever we want to kick off a concurrent computation, we do it as a fiber. And when we have a fiber, we can join it or interrupt it. You could say, well, then how come when I run this computation, I, don't, I can't interrupt it. I can't do anything with it. I can't join on it. I just get unit. I don't get something I can do these things with. Uh, and that's a little bit of a weird asymmetry as we, as we think about it of 
normally when we do the equivalent of kicking something off, when we fork a fiber, we get a fiber back. But when we run here, right now we're just getting unit. And that's pointing us to something that when we're calling run here, we're really almost doing two things. You can think of um, just in pseudocode, you can think of what this run is really doing is it's saying first, create a fiber and start it to do all this work and give the fiber this callback. Then return the unit value right now. And we could imagine we had a version where we return the fiber, but we could also imagine a version where we said, well, we don't need the fiber for whatever reason. We just want to make sure we kick this off. We just want that effect. And so what that's pointing us to is this uh, insight that I, th I think is one of the um, really important ones is, as you go deeper in the implementation of these effect systems, that this run loop is itself a fiber. So if you go back to the initial distinction between like Zio and something like future, Zio is, a, is just a description. It's not a running computation. It's just a to-do list of here are the things I want to do versus a future is a in-flight computation. As soon as you see a future, in all likelihood, it's already going and doing things and it's done five things and maybe it's going to do 10 more. And so in the Zio world, the fiber is really the closest analogy to the future and the fiber gives us other things of the ability to interrupt it and do all these other things. But the fiber is, is very, in a way, very similar to the future in that both of those represent things that are in flight as soon as we see them. When we see a fiber, it's probably already done some things. It's probably already doing, going to do more if it hasn't already finished. And that's exactly what this run loop is because this run loop is just in the process of continually going through these instructions in the Zio language and executing them one at a time. So when we see a fiber, what we should really think about is we're seeing a run loop that's just going through and executing steps in the Zio computation and eventually is gonna produce a result for us when it's done or we can potentially stop it from continuing to execute steps in that run loop. So let's explore a little bit about, okay, that's kind of hopefully makes sense in terms of conceptually. If not, please feel free to jump in on the Discord and we'll step back on that. But let's think about how we take that from just being kind of code here to actually being reality. And so to do that, what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm ultimately gonna want this to return a fiber. And then I could always have a version that just returns unit as well. Uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a new kind of fiber. And so before we had this general concept of fiber, and then we had this specific fiber impl. And this new thing I'm going to create is, is kind of going to be the next generation version of the fiber impl. I'm going to give it a new name. Uh, eventually, we're just going to basically get rid of the fiber impl. But you can think of this as the next generation version of the fiber impl. Uh, and I'm going to call this fiber context here uh, because this is the name that has in Zio. And I think there's some logic to it that it represents uh, a fiber with the context necessary for evaluation. That's why it has that name, that it has all this other context, that it has the stack, and it has whether it's interruptible or not, and it has. The, what callbacks are waiting on it and whether it has a result. It has all this information that is needed to actually go through and evaluate this thing. So this is gonna extend the fiber. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm basically going to copy this whole run loop up from run here into this fiber context. And then I'm going to create a bunch of compilation issues for myself. And <laughs> I will spend a little bit of time working through this, as is my usual approach. <laughs> so we'll put this in here. Let's see if my copy paste works. OK. And let me, let me get my auto compilation going. Maybe I'll do 
this out and I'll get rid of that. Okay, and now we've got some compilation errors. So let's work through these. So a lot of these are just gonna be pretty straightforward. So before this was a method on the Zio trait. So the current Zio when we started was self. Now it's this other thing. So I'm just, when I have self, instead of using self, I'm gonna use this start Zio thing up here. So this is gonna become start Zio. And then I've kind of messed up this callback thing right now because in the, in the old way we were thinking about things, uh, this run method just took one callback, which was the final client callback that we were gonna return. And now in a way we're gonna be able to be a little more principled because we're gonna say this just is a fiber. And we saw last time that a fiber could potentially have multiple callbacks of different people who are waiting on the results of the fiber. Uh, but we're going to have to do a little bit of work to uh, reintegrate the run loop with the fiber because we have those two pieces of state and we got to put them together and link them up in the right way. So I sometimes like to just get back to compiling <laughs> successfully the things and then fix some of this. So right now I'm just going to comment this out and give myself a not implemented here. And then I think I'm going to do that in one other place here. Okay, so I fixed those compilation errors and now I got two more that are quite helpful. So this is telling me that fiber context right now extends fiber, but I haven't implemented the interface of a fiber, which right now has these two abstract methods of join and start. And I'm actually, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna get rid of the start method. Uh, this is a little bit of, it was not necessarily a right answer, but I think the semantics I'm going to go with here is that as soon as we create the fiber context, the fiber context should start running. Uh, so we're not going to have a separate start operator on it. And really the two fundamental operators on a fiber are going to be join and interrupt. So I'm going to get rid of start here, which I think is going to solve at least one of my problems. Uh, and uh, this is not going to now be an override. So I'm just going to get rid of this. I'm not going to have this concept of starting. And we'll see how we deal with that in a little while. Uh, and then I'm also I'm going to comment out this code under what it means to fork here. because I want to just get back to compiling and build a little bit of infrastructure for this first. All right, and so I need to implement this join method here. And right now, again, just going with my, oops, from my very simple initial approach, I'm just gonna leave this as a question mark. So I'm gonna hopefully at least get to the point where I'm compiling and I've just got question marks here. Okay, great. So now I'm compiling again and now I've got, okay, so I've got six question marks here that I've got to resolve. Uh, so let's work through these. So the first one is I need an implementation of join here. And so this is where uh, I need to pull in the rest of the state that was in the old fiber impl. Remember we said we had these two pieces of state, we had the state in the run loop and we had the state in the fiber impl we wanted to put them together. So far we've taken all the state from the run loop and we've put it into the fiber context. We also need to grab the state from the fiber impl and put it into the fiber context. So I'm going to find the fiber impl, which is down here. And I'm basically gonna grab the whole body of what I'm doing here. So we spent some time working through how to use these atomic variables and we create some operations in terms of them. So I'm gonna take this whole thing and I'm gonna pull it up here into my fiber context. And then I think there was a, let's see if there was an implementation join down here. We just have, yep, okay. So let's grab join. Okay, let's check our compilation status there. Okay, right. And so now we've got just a little bit of a name conflict here because we're using this complete name and we got, it's, I guess it's a, lot, it's a logical name in two different places, but it does, means two different things in those two different pieces of state we had. 
So one version of this complete method says, complete all the callbacks of when the result of the fiber is available, give that result to all of the people who are waiting on the fiber. And that was very logical for its thing. And then we also had this implementation of complete within what used to be the run loop that uh, in a way maybe complete wasn't the best name, but it basically said, if there's, no, if there's nothing else on the stack, there's nothing else left to do, then call the final client. Otherwise get something off the stack and continue the computation with that thing. So I think what I'm gonna do here is, uh, both of them are things that I need. It's just, I can't have them have the same name. So I think I'm gonna rename this to be, let's say continue, uh, because it's going to continue the computation as long as there's stuff to continue. And if not, it's ultimately gonna probably call the complete one. Uh, so I'm gonna call this continue. And so that will, I think, fix this error, but now give me some other ones. And so now I just need to go through here and I need to update these names. So this is gonna be continue, continue. This will eventually be continue if I get working. Okay. So I've resolved that little naming conflict. And so if we go back to kind of our we're down, we, we started with six question questions. We now have five and one of these is not a real one because this or, is a real one, but it's one for the future. It's not one for this refactoring because we just haven't implemented interrupt yet. So our next thing here is this continue method. So uh, just like we talked about a minute ago, this is the method that says, as we're executing the run loop after every step, we're gonna want the next step that we need to do. And this is either gonna get us the next step or if there are no next steps, it's gonna stop the loop and it's gonna you know, previously call the final client. And so this is where we just need to change something in our logic because there isn't really a final client because uh, there's not that one callback, it's just a fiber that has multiple callbacks. And so what we can do here is this is where we can call the other complete method. So if we're executing the run loop, and our stack's empty, there are no more continuations, then we should stop looping and we should call this complete method here, which is then gonna go through and it's basically going to look at all of the callbacks that are waiting for the result, and it's gonna call them back. And it's also gonna update the state to just be a state that instead of being empty with, instead of being running here, is gonna be done. And so then if anyone in the future tries to join the fiber and get its result, they're not even gonna to have to wait. They're just gonna get the result right away and be able to continue what they're doing. So that's just, we didn't have to do a whole lot. We just had to link together those two pieces of state in that particular way. Okay, so next thing here is this async node. And this is another case where we just have to deal with the fact that we don't have, we have the, multiple callbacks instead of the one callback. Uh, and this is actually gonna be pretty straightforward. So let's remember, I'll leave this comment out just so we can see the old one as we're doing this. So let's remember this register function is a function that is expecting a callback. So it's, if we think about this as some kind of third party API, it's saying when you have the value, do something with it. And so what we can do is before we just called that one callback from the client, now we can just call that complete method. So it, it's really, it's, it's, it's a very similar change to the one that we made uh, right above in the non-async, in the synchronous case, where just instead of calling the original callback, we call this complete method, which is kind of going to do the bookkeeping of calling all of the clients instead of just that one original client we have. So now we can get rid of this. And now, right. And so this is an area where, and we've seen this a couple of other times, uh, within the run loop, we, we're, we're forgetting a lot of type information because as we go through the different steps of the run loop, the types are gonna change on us. And it doesn't make sense for us to really try to keep track of those. So this A is just an any, but the complete's expecting an A of type A, not a lowercase a. And we know statically that it is an A because if we've gotten to the whole run loop, if we've 
it's correctly constructed the run loop through the operators you provided, then it's got to be an A. So within this little scope, we're just going to take the responsibility on ourselves to help comply with it. Okay, so I'm down to really two more. And so the next one is this fork node. And so this is going to be actually pretty similar to the old implementation. So before what we did was we created a fiber with this fiber impl, we started it, and then we just continued with that fiber as the value because someone else might want to do something with the fiber, might want to join it or interrupt it or what have you. So we said that fiber context was the new fiber impl. So we're just going to do that. So we'll say fiber is fiber context zero. And then we said that as soon as, at least in, in this current encoding, as soon as we create the fiber context, it's running. So we don't need to start it. And then we're still going to continue with the fiber. OK. And then we've got one more question mark here, which is this run method. And so this run method, what we're essentially going to, so if we want to start by just duplicating the current signature, what we could say is we could say something like, uh, let's do Balzio is going to uh, be, So we're going to take our the result, the A we get, and we're going to want to feed it to this callback. And then we can just kick off a new fiber context that's going to do that. And then in this case, we're just going to throw away that value. And so we'll, we'll see in a sec, we got, we got a couple of other just like cleanup things to do, but conceptually we were now, we're now mostly done with this refactoring where now we see that what it means to, what it meant to do this old run method we had was just to create a fiber and kick it off. Uh, it wasn't really anything else. And so in a way we, we've unified some of what we have here. Uh, now this is still, I would say, a little bit weird just because this is just the having the callback in the signature here is a little bit of a of a relic from the old encoding where we just had this one um, callback versus it being a fiber itself. So we can probably evolve this signature a little bit now. So we might, and we can also maybe just also clarify it because one of the things we want to ideally be really clear about is when we're um, describing things versus when we're doing things. So the vast majority of the operations here are just describing things. Like if I do zip with, even if I do fork, I'm describing the act of starting a concurrent process. I'm not actually starting one. Whereas this is different. This is actually doing this thing. So uh, I think maybe as my basis here, I'm gonna start with one that maybe I'll call unsafe run fiber. And this is just going to give me back a raw fiber. And this can be as simple as fiber context zero. So going back to this idea that the future, like a fiber is an in-flight computation, just the fact that you see a fiber here and that it's not suspended in a zero, like it is in say, fork, see how fork gave us a fiber inside a ZO. The fact that this is giving us a fiber outside a ZO, even if we didn't know the name of it, would tell us that this is an unsafe method. And that's why we're going to, and not, not like you should never use it, but that it actually does things versus describing them. So it's a different mode of reasoning than most of your ZO programs. And at least in a fully ZO application, you really only do this once at the very top of your application and the ZO app would handle that for you. So then we can use this to implement something that's more like this version. 
And I'm actually going to implement a slightly different version just to um, make sure we had a result here. So I'm going to implement one that I'm going to call unsafe run sync. That's going to give me an A. And so this one is, is going to also be unsafe in a little bit of an additional way that it's going to block for a result to be available because a ZEO is a potentially asynchronous computation, but this is going to actually synchronously give me this result just because for a lot of the little demos we have, it's going to be nice to like actually see the result. And I want to make sure that like the program doesn't terminate if there's more work to be done on one of these fibers before we're done. Uh, so for this, I'm going to create this latch here. And then I'm going to create a variable that's going to have, uh, and actually I want to make it an option. I'm going to make it uh, an A, and I'm going to be a little bit, they're going to make it null as instance of A. So this is basically an empty box that eventually I'm going to fill with that A when it's available. And then I'm going to say uh, Zio is going to be self flat map. And as soon as I have that result available, I'm going to succeed by setting the result to A and counting down the latch. Then I'm going to kick off this thing actually running. I'm going to wait for the latch. And then I can return the result. And let's see, what have I done here? Oh, uh, this needs to be self because there's no such thing as Zio here, but this whole thing is a Zio. So that. Okay. And so now I'm, I'm going to get rid of this because I, I really like these two more. And that's going to, I think, create a couple of compilation errors in our examples, but we'll fix those in a second. Yeah. So I think actually only one, which is nice. So before the way we were actually running these computations is we were calling the run method and we were giving it this callback. And that worked in, I think, all the examples we showed so far, but it creates a little bit of a risk that if this callback is completed asynchronously, the main thread could get to the end of the program and we could just shut down the JVM or at least the SBT instance that we're running uh, before we do the results, uh, which is not going to make our examples very fun. Uh, so we'll, we're going to be a little bit more um, solid with what we're doing uh, with that unsafe run sync thing. So uh, here, I just need to not use this method. Uh, actually, I'll keep that for a sec. Just go, I'll keep the same message here. Uh, but so here now I can just do val result is equal to run dot unsafe run sync. And then I can take this line and then I can get rid of that. I think that should compile. Okay, so I think, I think we have everything wired up to work again. It's just, yeah, we only have that one question mark for interrupt and that's just more illustrative because we're not calling that anywhere. Uh, I, I'll give my usual caveat that especially when we're doing low level stuff like this, uh, just because it compiled doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So let's, uh, we'll test some of our examples and we'll see if this works or if we have a little bit of debugging to do. Um, but I'm gonna try running a couple of these. So let's try a simple one. Let's try succeed. All right, succeed says howdy with a nice horse and a cowboy. The result was, you know, awesome, let's try couple others. Uh, let's try let's try Zippar and this as I know is actually not going to work and we'll see why it, or it's not going to work the way quite the way it should and we'll see why in one second. So if I do Zippar, okay so I don't know if everyone was able to see that with the uh, results here with the I, I know sometimes the text sizes people but so we got exactly the right ultimate outcome of we 
did these two things and then we got the result. But if, uh, if you were watching closely, you saw that there was a little bit of delay between these two. We didn't really get them starting at the exact same time. Uh, and that's because there's one bit of functionality that we had in the original version that we haven't carried over yet. Uh, let me see if I can find them in Fiber Impl and point us to that. Uh, I think, oh, yep. So it's right here. It's in this start. So here we had this execution context global execute, and then we submitted this thing for execution. So far, we're not using the execution context anyway. So <laughs> anywhere. So, so far our, our use of the fiber has been a little bit, we, we've done most of the uh, work we need, but we need one more part to actually get it, which is if we go to our fiber context here. So we describe all this stuff. We have the state, we have all these different operators gonna help us. What we do at the very end to actually kick this off is we call run, which begins the initial execution of the run loop. And right now this is just occurring on the current thread which is, is fine for these examples, but means that we're not actually doing this concurrently. So the final thing we need to do to get this working the way it should is here, we need to submit the whole point of the fiber is the fiber is supposed to be executed concurrently with the main program. So we wanna kick off this run loop uh, by submitting it to the executor instead of by running it ourselves. So we're gonna do uh, execution context global execute okay and we can definitely take this to do to look at how we do better than just always using the global execution context but let's do this as a starting point so now we'll try running that again and now if you saw like that was now very it was basically just as quick as the the console output of those two things began at the very same time. Uh, we can also do something like, let's do that stack safety one we did at the very beginning. Yep, lots and lots of howdies, 100,000 howdies. We still saw the 100,000 howdies. We still uh, were stack safe. So at this point, we have basically retained all the original functionality, but we've moved from having these two different pieces of state to having all the state in this one place in this fiber context that gives us all the context we could possibly need as we're evaluating this computation, which is really gonna set ourselves up for success as we're doing more work here. Um, so that is probably, uh, we'll definitely do more, but just a, a good check-in point. So uh, if anyone has questions, if that didn't make sense, if you wanna go back through everything, uh, or if you just had any other questions on like, hey, why is something the way it is? Or what, why did you do this before? This is probably a fantastic time to uh, jump in and we can tackle some of those before we uh, keep building from here. All right, I'm gonna check just a little. All right, it seems like we're good on uh, questions. So uh, I guess I'm gonna take, uh, oh, maybe we got one person or I'm gonna give a minute for people to have questions, and then we will uh, continue our journey here. Oh. Maybe not. Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going then, and I will I'll try to check back in in a minute. So at this point, we've now gone from maybe if if the clear encoding was checked before, now it's super check. So we we've got a really solid foundation there. We've got stack safety. We've got a solid foundation on the concurrency. The execution context is a nice one that we could work on uh, building and we can improve that a little bit. And then I think the next thing we'll work on is the error handling because that's gonna give us the basis for some of these other things. So if we wanna first think about the execution context, so, so far we've, the good thing is we don't have to pass around the implicit execution context. The bad thing is right now we're implicitly always using the global execution context, which we definitely don't wanna do. So what we can do to make that better is we can add a new element to our, um, we can make this part of the context for the fiber 
and we can add some offers to help us work with this. So we said this fiber context is to have all the context necessary for evaluation. So whenever we have some other piece of information we want, like what executor are we supposed to use? The easy answer of like, well, where do we get that? What do we do is we just put more state here. So let's imagine here we have, when we create a fiber, we have one more thing that we'll start, call the start executor. And we're just gonna use an execution context. In Zio, we have our own executor type that does a little bit more, but for this, we'll just use the execution context. And so we will have uh, a new variable we we'll create here. Uh, let's see, I think I'll just find a good, yeah, well, I'm gonna put it maybe right uh, here. I can say, our current executor. And initially, it's going to be the start executor. And let's follow our same process of starting with something basic and following the compilation errors. So first obvious thing is, OK, so now when I fork a new computation, I've got to give it an executor. And so the general principle that Zio follows, and it's, I think it's a very good one, is this idea of um, regional statuses and um, status being inherited from the broader region you're in. So as default, if we fork a new fiber, where should it be run? It should be run wherever the current fiber is. We'll add some tools to change that, but that's a very good compositional default. So there we're gonna use our current executor. And now I have one more compilation error here. Okay, and so this one is, so when I call unsafe run, what executor should I use? And so here's where we might want to, maybe in the ZO object here, we'll say something like uh, private val default executor. And initially this is just gonna be the execution context global, just because I don't want to take the time here to custom configure our own executor execution context. And so now we can say, okay, when you when you kick something off, we're going to start on this default executor here. And I think we made this pretty. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I'm actually let's see, do one or. I think I'm going to make this private just so we enforce a little bit. We'll, we'll let the users call this unsafe run sync. We'll keep this private. And I'm actually gonna make this whole fiber context thing here private. And so this is another nice aspect of this pattern of, at this point I've like taken all the implementation details, like all the ugliness, I've put it in this one place and I've made it private so I can do whatever I want with it. And I don't have to worry about binary compatibility or anything else. And all the API I'm exposing is just these like nice Zeo operators. Uh, and then I can actually also comment out this whole uh, fiber impl thing. And maybe I'll just delete this just because this file is getting kind of big and I don't want to spend too much time scrolling back and forth. So let's make sure it still works. Okay, great. So now when I kick off the run loop, I don't have to use execution context.global anymore. I can use the current executor. And so now if I check myself, the only time I'm referring to the global execution context is here when I define default executor. And again, this is private. So now this is a very implementation detail of the starting one happens to be the global execution context. I can make it whatever I want. And I'm not going to change anything in my user's API. So, okay, so now we've got uh, this, we've isolated this global execution context. It's not just this code smell of being all around our application, but we don't actually have an ability to change to anything other than that yet. So to do that, we're going to create some more operators for ourselves. And the general pattern here is whenever we're working with this fiber context, we just saw like step one is you need some additional state, just add it to the fiber context. We need an executor, just add it to the fiber context. The next couple of steps is gonna be, we're going to typically need a new primitive in our ZO uh, set of operators. 
that lets us set that and also typically one that lets us get it. Uh, I think in this case, we'll, we'll, I think we may just do the, the setting, but we can, we can do setting and getting. So what that would look like is we're gonna start with what's probably the most primitive operator for just dealing with execution contexts, which in Zio is one called shift. Uh, it's actually probably not the one you use most, but it's the, it's the most primitive. And then the ones you use are built on top of that along with some other tools. Uh, so shift is just going to take a new executor that we want to run on. And it's just going to shift execution to that executor. So we're going to follow the same pattern we did before on the first week of we're going to implement this just by creating a new primitive. And so I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna say case class shift. Uh, and this is going to take an executor, so execution context. It's gonna extend ZO of unit. And so here, oh, and this is not gonna be A because there is no A, just gonna be unit. And so this would be uh, zio dot shift executor. And then whenever I create a new term here, the other thing I have to do is I have to go to the run loop and I have to actually build in how this should be interpreted. So we'll do case zio dot shift executor. And all this is going to do is when we get this instruction, we're going to change the executor we're running on to this new executor. And then because this thing returns unit, we're just gonna continue with unit. And so now we have the ability to shift where our computations are executed. And right now this is, this is you can think of as a one-time shift of like, as soon as you do this, you're just going to shift for everything for everything you're doing. Uh, there is another uh, variant we're going to build on top of this that's going to shift you and shift you back. Uh, but this is just going to say, just send me to this place. Let me run there forever. Don't worry about bringing me back. Just shift to this place. That's why it's called shift versus the ones that we probably use more as uh, lock that says, bring me there and then bring me back when this thing is done. Uh, but we'll build a little bit more tooling before we uh, implement lock and we'll see how that's actually implemented in terms of shift and a couple other things. So that now really gives us the ability to uh, set the executor and now makes this a lot cleaner. If we wanted to, we could implement another version that lets us get the executor. If we want to get Zio's executor and use it for something else, feed it to something. Uh, I think right now we'll, we'll focus on a couple other things uh, just in the interest of time, but that's the other thing you can add there. So I think going up here now, so custom execution context check. The next thing I wanna hit on is error handling. So, so far our Zio data type, if we go to our trait Zio, it just has an A. So it's missing one of the really critical components for uh, an effect system like this of the ability to properly manage uh, errors of right now, this doesn't have the ability to fail at all. And even if we had the ability to fail with like a throwable or something, it doesn't have the ability to express how we can fail or whether computations can fail at all. And that creates a lot of problems of, you have to be very defensive in your programming of any time you're dealing with something, you don't know how it could fail. So I've got to handle every possible failure. And then you don't even know if you handled your failures of, if I have a Z of A and then I handle all the failures, I still get back a Z of A and it's exactly the same type signature even though I theoretically handled all the failures. So it's not a good situation. So the other thing we're gonna wanna try to do in this session is we're gonna build in the E type, uh, the error type. It's gonna represent how a ZO computation can fail. And so the first step, whenever you add a new type parameter, uh, at least I find, is just 
add the type parameter. Initially, it may not have any semantics, but just add the type parameter. And depending on how much work you've already done, it, it's very mechanical, but you, there's a little bit of work of just, you got to change all the type signatures. So we'll, we'll do this together right now. Uh, I won't think it'd be too bad. But so we're going to change from a ZO of A to a ZO of EA. And now I'm going to create a ton of compilation failures, and we're just going to follow those through. And so like succeed is a computation that can't fail at all. Also, I'm going to see if I can just get the cascade compile going just so I can, maybe I can get some squigglies here. Sometimes it's hit or miss. Uh, okay, so let's go through some of these other ones. So a fiber in this world then also has to have the ability to fail. If I join it, I could fail with the same error. Interrupting can't fail at all, but we still have to verify what interruption is. Let's look at some of these other ones here. Uh, so we're going to have to update all these signatures here. So shift, we can't fail and just shifting an executor. Fork, we can't fail in forking though the effect we're forking can fail. And this is going to need an E. This is going to need an E. Async. Uh, right now we're going to, we can decide whether we want this to be like, always allow a throwable or what have you here. Right now I'm going to let this be nothing. Flat map now. So now we've got a, E and A and a B. So this is going to be a Z O E A. I'm just going to go to Z O E B and give us back a Z O E B. So effect here. So this is where we're going to start to, I'm, I'm going to finish doing this refactoring and then I think we're going to come back and do some naming here because this isn't necessarily the most clear naming. Um, but right now I'm going to think about this as the one that just suspends effects that can't fail at all. We're going we're gonna to add some additional operators, but first we're just going to add this type parameter. We're going to get back to compilation. <laughs> so we're going to extend nothing here. Oh, and I don't need nothing here. That was silly of me, as it was silly there. This is what happens when I don't have kids to keep me honest. OK, that's going to be nothing, 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 nothing. Okay, let's check in. Okay, down to 23. So then if I unsafely run this as a fiber, I'm gonna get a fiber EA. And then, so here is where we're gonna uh, follow the pattern we learned when we were talking about variance a little bit of what I basically wanna do is I just wanna say, if I've got an original computation that can fail and a new computation that can fail, then the result of doing both of them can fail. Uh, but because of variance, and I think it actually also makes sense, uh, this isn't going to work as written. But what I can do is I can say I have this E1 is a super type of E. And then these are going to become E1s. And the logical interpretation of that is if I have an original effect that can fail with some subset, some set of errors, and then I have another effect that can fail with some broader set of errors, then doing them both can fail with that broader set of errors, which when you put that way is, is very logical. So I'm just going to carry that through to the signatures of some of these other variants. Okay, this thing we saw, we said it couldn't fail, just shifting executors. Uh, so this thing, so this is repeating the same computation multiple times. So if the original one could fail, then repeating it can definitely fail as well. So mapping just maps the success values. So mapping isn't going to change the error type, it's just going to be the same. Flat map is another one of these ones like zip where we're going to do this other computation afterwards that could fail with some broader set of errors. 
And so the whole thing could fail with that broader set of errors. As is like math, it's not changing the error type. So that'll just be E. And then we said forking could fail itself, but the fiber could fail. So I think that was a bunch. Let's recheck our, okay. Eight compilation errors, not too bad for adding a whole new type parameter. So let's follow some of those through. So I think this is because I think we need to update the signature of fiber context. Yep, because fiber context can also fail and extends a fiber that can fail. All right, six compilation errors. Okay, this was just, uh, so this was just silliness on my part if I missed this one. So this is another E1, this type of E1. E1. Okay, so now we're in the run loop here. This is where we're just like basically forgetting the type parameters uh, because we don't want to use them within the run loop. So we just need to, again, update our signatures. So let's see, any, any, because we have two type parameters. We said when we join, if the thing we're joining fails, then we're going to fail ourselves. And let's start zero, this is zero, EA. Okay, and now, oh, let, yay, we unlocked some more compilation errors that are in this file. Uh, so let's do some of these. So print line can't fail. Fail right now. Fail. Notice that for almost all the concrete types, we're just saying they can't fail right now because we haven't actually introduced a way for them to fail, but we are, we're just laying the groundwork for ourselves here and we will see how we add that very shortly. Let's see where I'm at. All right, four left. Okay. So we're back to compiling after having done that refactoring. So in a way it wasn't very impressive because we actually haven't changed any functionality. We just added the unused type parameter right now, but it was a necessary step. So let's just confirm that everything is still working. We'll like run our zip far example again. There we go. We'll do our little printing howdy. Yay, howdy. All right. So now we've added this type parameter. So now the next step is to do something with it. And whenever you have one of these uh, type parameters, a good way to think about it is you want to have a way to introduce that type parameter and you want to have a way to eliminate that type parameter. So in the case of the domain of errors, what it would mean to introduce an error is to fail. And what it would mean to eliminate the type parameter would be you want to have a way to recover from the failures. And just like we've seen before that with a couple of these basic operator that at this point we only have six operators and you could really say this one is uh, very, very specific. Uh, it's just this specific thing of like where we wanna run on, but these other ones are really, a lot of them are very general. Uh, and because we picked the right ones, we were able to implement a lot of other operators on top of them. And that's really the idea of that concept of introduction and elimination that if you can do those two, you can basically do everything else and it'll make, us, make it really easy for us to do this. Uh, while we're here, I think I'm gonna just do one cleanup. Uh, 
So right now this effect thing, what, the, what it means for it to be effect is a little bit unclear. Like, is this something can fail? Is this something to not fail? Uh, also exposing both of these is a little bit unclear. Uh, a really common mistake people can make is they uh, use succeed for things that actually do some kind of side effects and should be suspended. So I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna rename this. Uh, well, first, sorry, I will rename this to succeed now. And I'm gonna rename this to succeed. And then I'm gonna do, oh, and perfect. So that's already, I guess, more consistent with this. Though I'm a little unclear on whether my little renaming automatically worked. Uh, but so succeed now is gonna be that. And this is gonna be zio.succeed. And let's see. Yeah, I don't have a lot of confidence that that was automatically done correctly. So we'll have to. Okay, so this will be now. This will be succeed. Okay, perfect. And then I'm actually even, I'm going to make this succeed now. Uh, I think private. Let's see, can I do that? Or am I going to get in trouble with that? Uh, Oh, I see. okay. So I'm all right. I'm not gonna make it private for now. But if I was actually like, this is what we're doing in, in Zio is this exists internally just to be like slightly, slightly more efficient um, for just because we do it all the time internally. But really, all you want to expose is, is this because that way users don't have to worry about whether they're suspending things or not. We just always do the right thing for you. Uh, okay. So with that cleanup, we said we needed introduction and elimination operators. Uh, oh, let me just make sure I, okay, perfect. We're compiling it. All right. So yeah, I'm just gonna check. Okay, great. We seem to be okay on questions. And yeah, please jump in any time if, uh, if you have any questions here. Uh, all right, so first thing we're gonna want is a way to introduce errors to fail. And we're gonna give that the name of fail. And so this is just gonna take an error and it's just gonna fail with that error. And we're going to follow the same pattern that we have with these other operators. Uh, I'm going to do case class fail with an E. And this is going to be pretty similar to this uh, succeed, which has a nice symmetry there. Of It's going to take an E. That is going to be the E it's going to fail with. I'm going to do the same little thunk thing just so I suspend it so I can make sure that I'm properly managing it in the runtime versus doing something in, in user land accidentally. Uh, and so now I've got that. And so now I can implement fail here. And now, just like when we implemented shift, I need to actually go and implement the handling of this. And so here's where we, uh, let's see. And before we do the actual implementation of this, let's, uh, let's set up the same thing for the elimination, just because uh, those two are gonna interact with each other when we wanna think about the right way to implement it within the run loop. So I think it'll be a little bit clearer if we see what both of them need to do, and then we can implement both of them together. So the, the introduction operator is fail. The other thing we need is a elimination operator, an operator that gives us an ability to handle the errors. And in Zio, the most general operator to do that uh, is one that's called fold Zio. And so this one is gonna take a new error type and a new value type. And it's gonna be like flat map, except it's gonna let us handle both the failures and the successes. So if there's a failure, it's gonna let us provide this function that is gonna let us go from the failure to a new ZO effect that could fail in its own potentially completely different way. 
Uh, and so notice this isn't a super type, this is an unrelated type, which means that we could just change the type of the failure. We could go from having a domain failure to a throwable or one domain failure to a different domain failure, or this could be none. So we could recover from the failure by doing something that can't fail at all and eliminate the possibility of failure. And then we're also gonna have a success handler that's gonna do the same thing for the success case. And it could also fail and it can also turn a value and it's gonna give us back a Z of E2B. And uh, this, this is a good place. Uh, please jump in if this doesn't make sense. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna do one or two examples of why this is fundamental and why we can implement other things in terms of this. But if this doesn't make sense, this is a great thing to, to jump in on. Uh, so I'm gonna use this to implement a couple of other operators that are gonna be helpful. So one we can implement in terms of this is one that, so notice this fold ZO, let me take the failure and success and perform a new ZEO. Another simpler variant of this that ends up being pretty useful is what we would just call fold. And so this just takes a B and this just says, well, if there's a failure, recover from it with a new B and there's, there's a success, recover from it with this function. And so this ends up being pretty easy to implement in terms of fold zero, because if I have an error, then I can just succeed with the failure handler. And if I have a value, I can just succeed now with the success handler. And we can use this to and another one that may be maybe, maybe more near and dear to your hearts, I guess we'll, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but we can implement one called catch all. And so this is really, it's essentially just gonna do the failure part. So it's gonna, it's gonna be like catch and try catch. Of, it's not gonna change the success value if it's successful, it's just gonna do something with the error. And so this would say, okay, I can take a function from E2, or excuse me, from E, to E2B, uh, and this isn't actually going to be B, this is going to be A1 is a super type of A, because since we're not changing the success type, we've got to make the error into a success type itself, or at least a super type of it. And so this is going to give us back a ZO of E2, A1. And we can implement this also in terms of this fold ZO. And this one can just be, well, if it's an error, then do F of E. And if it's an A, then just succeed with that. So hopefully from this, you can get a sense of why this uh, fold ZO becomes the uh, very essential error handling operator uh, that if we have this, we can implement all these other operators for handling errors. If you, if you actually look at ZO and you look at, its, at the source code, you'll see there's so many operators that are implemented in terms of this fold ZO that do everything possible you could think of to shift values between the error and success channels. So, okay, this seems great. How do we actually implement it? Well, just like everything else, our first step is gonna be just create a data type. So we'll do a case class, I'm just gonna call this fold. And so this is gonna have a couple different type parameters here. And so we're gonna have an initial ZO that can fail with an E or succeed with an A. Then we're gonna have this failure function. It's gonna go from that E to a new E. And then we're gonna have a success function that can go from the E2 to, from the E, from the A, excuse me, <laughs> to the E2 or the B. And then that's eventually gonna give us back a ZO of E2 or B. And so with that, I can then go to my fold ZO and I can just say this is ZO.fold self failure success. Okay. And now this is compile again. The one problem I've got is down here. I am gonna need to handle this.
So now we've got the question of how do I want to implement these in the run loop? So there's one part of this that's pretty easy, which is the success case. The success case is uh, basically identical to the treatment of flat map. Of uh, if I've got a success, then I just want to do this. And then when this is done, eventually I want to pop this thing off the stack. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the one that's more complicated is this failure case. And so the semantics we want to think about for failure and what really makes failure different than success is when we fail, we don't go on to do the next thing, uh, at least until we get to something that can actually handle the failure. So if we think of having code that's like zeo dot fail one uh, dot flat map uh, zeo dot succeed print line here. So if we have code like this, if this fails, then we don't even want this thing to be run. But we do want, by the time we get here, we want to be able to recover from it. And so what that means is that we essentially want the ability to skip through the stack. Of if the next thing on the stack isn't an error handler, then we just want to throw it away. And we're just going to keep digging, digging through the stack until we find something as an error handler. And when we do, we're going to take that and we're going to use it to handle the error and then we're going to keep going. But until we do, we're just going to dig, dig, dig through the stack. And so that leads us to a couple of things of one, we need to be able to put this error handler on the stack. And then two, we need something that's going to dig through the stack to find it for us. So let's do the first thing uh, first. So if we have this fold case, what we'd like to do is something pretty similar to flat map here of we want to push the fold onto the stack. So here I could do fold at zeo.fold. And so I could say, push the fold onto the stack. And then if I'm doing normal execution, if I'm going through this run loop and I hit a fold normally, then that means I've got a success. So I'm gonna put that on here and then I'm gonna to wanna to execute this thing here. So this is intuitively what I wanna do. Now this, if we run it, is not gonna compile for me. And the reason for that is that at least right now, a fold isn't a continuation because recall that the stack is a stack of these continuation things. And a continuation, well, <laughs> we've made it. Continuation is a function from any to a zero value that we've forgotten the type of. And a fold isn't a function from any to zero. It's just a fold and ultimately a zero, but not a function from any to zero. So right now we can't put it on the stack, but we can actually change that for ourselves. So what I can do here is I can say this, in addition to extending Zio, it extends function A to Zio E to B. So this success case is going to be the continuation that is going to be what this is as a function. And so if I do that, then I can implement an apply method here. That's just the success case. And then I got, oh, I need a parenthesis there. Okay. And so now this compiles again. So this says that a fold I can treat as a continuation function just by applying the success handler to it. And we'll see what I'll do with the failure handler in a minute. So now when I'm interpreting a 
fold here. I'm just going to push that onto the stack. And then I'm going to go on to this inner computation. And if I never have a failure, this is going to act essentially like a flat map. Of I'm going to just push that success onto the stack. And then whenever I'm done with one of these steps, I'm going to call this continue thing. And the continue is going to pop something off the stack and call it. And all of that's going to work fine. So now I've, I've got the fold in the stack. I've got everything working except the actual error handling, which I need to handle. <laughs> so now we'll do that. And so what that's going to require is conceptually what I want to do here is I need to find the next error handler. And then if it exists, use it. If not, fail the whole computation. Right, then, I, then I'm done. Then I want to actually call that. I want to call my clients and tell them that we failed. So let's see how we do this. So to do this, I'm going to make a helper function for myself, just like I had this continue here that kind of helped me handle all the logic of so continuation. And I'll call this find next error handler. And this is going to give me back a continuation. And so what I'm going to want to do here is I'm going to want to uh, I'm going to do this in a very imperative way. I basically just want to, I'm just going to loop and I'm going to keep pulling things until I find one that's an error handler. Uh, so I'm, and I'm also going to use very low level stuff of uh, nulls instead of options here. So I'm going to say, I'm going to start out with null as my continuation value. And then while I'm looping, so I'm going to want to get a continuation off the stack. Uh, so I can say, uh, oh, actually I can probably say, uh, let's see, why don't we say if, stack is empty, then just stop looping. Otherwise, so now it's safe for me to pop something off the stack. And then I can look at that thing. And I can say, if the continuation is an instance of one of these fold things, which I believe takes three type parameters, uh, then I'm going to do one thing. And otherwise, I'm going to do something else. Let's just look at what we got. Oh, this needs to be zero.fold. And let's see what else we got going on. Oh, and then when this is all done, I need to return the continuation. This is why we avoid writing a little of code we can. And then I guess this actually has four type parameters, which would be important. OK. All right, so let's think about these two cases. So. This first case here, I found a error handler. So, uh, and actually, I think I'm going to want this to be uh, a fold. Okay, so. Uh, if this is a fold, then I can just say uh, loop equals false, because I've already set the continuation to that. So I should be good to go there. And otherwise, I actually don't have anything to do here, because in that case, I'm just going to go back through the loop again. And so I think. You know, the caveat of like being easy to make mistakes with low level code. I think we can just say the stack's empty, we're done. Otherwise, pop something off the stack. If it is a fold, we're done. Otherwise, keep looping. And again, oh, and again I shouldn't be able to see what the fold. Yeah, so uh, 
Okay, so let's see. All right, so let's say call this down. I'm gonna call this uh, error handler. And then I can say uh, oh, cont is equal to stack.pop. And then here I'll say error handler. So I'll do it cont as in six bytes. And then this will be error handler. Okay. So this is going to do the job of digging through the stack and it's either eventually going to give me back null if there was no error handler or it's going to give me back an error handler. Uh, so we can then say val error handler is find next error handler. And so now we have two possibilities, right? So one possibility is the error handler is null. And the other possibility is there actually is an error handler. Uh, so let's think about those now for a bit. So if error handler here is null, that means I've gone through the whole stack and I haven't found any error handlers. So that means that this is actually an error that I want to, I'm just done. Like I, my fiber has, is now failing with this error. I've got to tell my clients about that error. I'm done. So this is going to push us one thing we didn't do so far is update the signature of this complete method. Uh, because before in this in the previous world, the only way we could be done is with an A. So it made sense that we completed with an A. Uh, and it made sense that these callbacks were all callbacks from A's to any. But in this new world, when we're done, we can either be done with an E or an A. So we're actually gonna to want to uh, supplement some of these signatures. And so an easy way to initial way to do that, and we'll probably add a little bit more of this in the future, but right now I'm going to uh, turn this result thing into an either EA. And I'm gonna turn each of these callbacks into a callback that takes an either EA to a result. And I'm going to create some compilation errors for myself here, and I'm going to follow those through. Uh, so here, this is the async case. So I got an A. And so some of these, I'm basically, I'm just going to do uh, right when it's a success. Make these work. And here, this is where I'm continuing with an A. So I'll call this. Uh, Right. And then, right, so now when we await, we're not going to await with a callback A to any, but either the A to any. I just need to that through in a couple places. Uh, so this one's kind of interesting. So I'm gonna need to do a little bit more work here because this is going to be a callback now that accepts an either EA, but now I've got this ZO nothing either EA, whereas I need a ZO EA. And fortunately, that's a pretty easy, uh, thing for me to solve. I'm gonna make one more helper for myself here. Uh, I'm gonna go to the companion object and I'm going to create an operator that I'm gonna call uh, from either. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold on the either. And if it's an E, then I'll fail with that E. And if it's A, then I will Oops, excuse me. I will succeed now with it. And now I can just plot now ZO from either. Now it should make that error go away. Great. And now I just got a couple more here. So here I am done with the result. 
And so the result is the other piece of the state that now the result is not necessarily an A, but an either EA. Okay, so looks like everything's compiling there. There's probably a little bit of a risk of we don't have full type safety within the realm loop here. Um, so we'll, we'll do some tests in a, in a bit, uh, as well as wrap up in a bit. <laughs> Uh, but let's see if we can get this uh, working here. So if the error handler is null, then we're going to call complete with the left of the E. And this is another, oh, we just need to, that's a thunk. So we just need to do the little parentheses on it. And then we need to, do the same as instance of here. Okay, great. All right, so then the other case is if we have an error handler, then this thing is a fold. So then we can say, basically do the same thing we do when we pop something off the stack of do this current ZO equals cont of value except this time it's not going to be cont, but it's going to be this uh, error. So we'll say uh, current XIO equals uh, error handler dot, I think we called it failure uh, of the error. And we may need to do a little cast here. Oh, uh, let me spell correctly. Okay. And then this, uh, we're going to, I think we, yeah, let's, uh, I think we can make these all any, 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 any. That look a little better for us. And if I wanted to, I could, might make sense to do one of these, uh, just like I had the erased type for the race CEO, I could do like an erased fold to make this a little nicer for myself, but that's fine for now. Okay, so there we go. So if there's no more error handler, then call the clients and tell them that we failed. Otherwise, apply the error handler, which is gonna give us a new ZO and make that the next ZO that we're going to run. And that should give us everything we need. So let's maybe quickly, uh, let's try running a few of these, make sure things are still working. OK, Zipfire is still working. Stack safety still working. Great. It's probably where we could use a test suite, but we don't have ZO test because we need ZO before we can have ZO test. <laughs> so we don't have to deal with that for now. All right, so let's try to create a little example here for ourselves just so we can see some of this uh, functionality in action. And I think we may have to update at least one other signature for ourselves here. So let's go and look at what we have going on with unsafe run here. Yeah, so okay, so here's where we've got and partly because we're using these, some of these casts and stuff, but unsafe run sync now, uh, why don't we have this? We could have one that throws, but why don't we have one that uh, returns the error? I think that would be a little bit nicer. And so now this is gonna be as instance of either EA. And so now, instead of using flat map here, we can use fold uh, zio. And so we'll have these two cases. And so first one is gonna be the error case. And second one's gonna be the success case. So the success case is basically the same if we succeed, except we're gonna set the result to a right of an A and we'll count down the latch. And if we fail, then we're going to recover from that failure and we're going to set the result equal to a left and we're still going to count down the match. 
and then this needs to be a parentheses. Okay. All right. So now we should have the tools. Let's uh, just make sure that I probably have to change one other type signature here. Or maybe more than one. Let's see. Okay, let's go pick this. Uh, well, right. That is indeed an IDA. Okay. All right. So uh, let's try creating an example for ourselves here. Um, sorry, let me get a version that doesn't have the split screen. Excellent. Okay. So let's create object error handling, extend ZO app. And so this time, let's start with a really simple example. So let's say my program is equal to zero dot fail failed. And we'll say dot run. That's my program. All right. Let's try running this. Uh, let's find a number. Number is one. Okay. So we saw we ran this program that failed, and we got a left. It was failed. Let's try making this uh, more complex. So let's do flat map zero.succeed print line here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we would expect this not to run because this fails. So this should never be run. So let's make sure that that's happening. And I forgot my numbers of one. It's easy. Okay. And so we see exactly what we expected, that we got the result was left failed, but we never saw this printed. And let's make things a little bit more complex. So now let's do catch all uh, e zero dot succeed uh, at line recovered from an error. See if this works. There we go. So now we see that this never got executed because we just did throw things. We don't do anything until we get to an error handler. And then when we got to an error handler and this ran, it printed this. And because we caught it and succeeded, and this in this case, this was just a print line, so it didn't return an actual value here, we got the result was right unit. So that's, that's error handling for us. I think we got a couple of questions. So I'm just going to briefly switch over to them. And then I know we're probably at time here so we can break. Um, but let's see, could you explain in which situation we have more than one error handler and why the next one is always the relevant one? Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, let's say that I then do flat map. Uh, right now I'm just gonna say uh, something else here. And then I catch all and I do something else there. So now if I'm like looking at this whole program, I can have multiple error handlers potentially in the stack. Um, but the one I wanna use is the, is the next one up. I wanna kind of keep going through what's supposed to happen and you know, if I have a whole program that has a hundred steps and step three fails and step five is an error handler, I want to use that error handler. And then I want to go on and do step six, seven, eight, and nine. I don't want to jump to the error handler at like 93, because if I do that, then I'm, I either have to do one of two things. I have to not run at all anything between six and 92, which is going to result in things not running that you expect to be run, which is going to be wrong. Um, or I'm going to have a type safety issue of that error handler at like 93 may return a string, but the continuation at six is expecting a list. Uh, so I, I, I always have to take the next error handler and use that and then continue with the stack because as long as I do that, then I maintain the integrity of the stack and I make sure that each continuation is able to use the thing that the last continuation produces. Um, hopefully that answers that question. Um, any other questions before we break here? Uh, so just to summarize uh, what we've done today, we I think really made a lot of progress. We uh, moved to this 
uh, encoding that's really gonna set ourselves up to the future of this fiber context that builds in all the state together for our application. And we also built in basic error handling. Uh, some of the things we probably tackle next time is we can talk about um, typed failures versus untyped failures. So what if I have something that says the error type is nothing, but I throw an exception in there? How is that handled? And that'll lead us to talk about cause and exit data types in Zio. Uh, and then I think the other thing we can really build on from there is the concept of interruption, uh, what it means to interrupt, how it can be handled, operators for handling it, uh, and how that leads to resource safety in Zio. And then the final thing we can do is we can look at the environment type and how we uh, go through and we add one more type parameter to everything. But uh, I think that's more than enough for today. So uh, thank you so much for your time, everyone.